morning, everyone. So great to be together this morning. And uh, I put the right password in. And uh, so great to be with our Stocksbridge campus as well. And I uh, want to give everyone a huge welcome. Uh, and uh, if this is your first time at Icon Church, then we want to give you a huge welcome and say welcome home. So come on, church, let's welcome everyone. So great to be together. Why don't you give the person next to you either side a high five and uh, take your seats. Before I uh, get into the message today, I wanted to do something uh, special uh, as uh, this week uh, our young people, 73 uh, young people went to Getaway which was, uh, by all reports, a great time. But I I thought it would be great just to hear some stories from some young people. And uh, and so I'd love you to give a round of applause for Izzy Riddell, Olivia Mumba, and Jacob DePledge. Come on, come on to the stage. Awesome. And um, I'm kind of just going to let you guys tell us your highlight, what, what, maybe what God did in your life or what was amazing about Getaway. Uh, I'm glad the team haven't started my countdown either, uh, so you're not going to eat into my time. But if you go too long the, on that screen there, there'll just be a big red flashing light. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. So come on, Izzy, tell us about Getaway. Well... I only found out about this five minutes ago, but luckily on the first night, um, it was a really powerful night, but after the first night, I wrote something down. So I'm going to read what I wrote and I'm going to explain it. So basically I wrote, it's only the first night and God has already moved so powerfully. This getaway is a rock for so many people and Jesus is moving, leaders are being born and faith is being built. So on the first night, typically it's like easing you into getaway, right? It's like, I don't know, normally on the second night, people are on the floor crying, the Holy Spirit's like moving. But the first night, it's not like typically like that. Well, for the two getaways, I've been there. And on that first night, God moved so powerfully and it was so unexpected. Like, I don't even know how to explain it. Like, it was one of those things where you had to be there to, to like understand and see it. But basically, I wrote that that night just proved how powerful God can be no matter what the time is. And I think this getaway um, has planted so many seeds of faith in people's lives. Um, I know a lot of my connects have been talking to us now about how they are starting to believe more and like their faith is being built and I just think that it's the beginning of seeing people's faith flourishing through Icon Youth and uh, so many people who've never seen such a movement of faith were in awe and I think that first night was such a powerful night in the sense that people were asking questions and saying like what's happening why are people doing this like what is this and I think that's just such a great thing to learn about and I think that's a great faith builder so thank you. So good, amazing. Olivia, swap places, come into the middle. Come on, Olivia, step forward. We think, I think you're amazing, Olivia. You're the best. You're the best mumba. I can't believe I said that through the mic. I am going to pay for that. Nancy's giving me dagger. Anyway, sorry, Stokesbridge. Go on, Olivia, tell us about Getaway. Um, So I think my highlight, and I think this has always been my highlight, all the Getaways have been to, but I think it's probably worship because I think you could just feel God's presence in the room like when we're doing worship, and it's really good. Awesome. Awesome. So good. Come on, Jacob. Now, you might, might not know all the DePledge boys, but uh, Jacob is the tallest and the youngest. And so, and you got all the good looks as well, didn't you, mate? <laughs> awesome. Tell us, tell us about Getaway, but also tell us if there were any pranks pulled or anything like that. Because I, I want to know, because I am a prankster, so I, wanna, like, I want to store some in my memory ready for when I pull some pranks on Debbie. Stuff, so go for it, mate. Um, 
my highlight of Getaway was on the second night, watching um, how many people were encountering God and um, being filled with his spirit. Great. Awesome. Um, yeah. Did you pull any pranks? Uh, we put two sliders on a shoe on Jack's head, and we put a Nerf bullet in his ear. <laughs> what, while he was asleep? Yeah. While he was asleep. Awesome. Well, come on, give it up for these guys. Thanks, Izzy. Thanks, Olivia. Thanks, Jacob. And um, Getaway is always a special time for all of our young people. And, um, you know, if you're a young person in the pl- this place, don't uh, let Getaway stay at Getaway. But actually take it into your life and let it build your faith as well. And So we're going to get into God's Word right now. And um, really, you know, just as April said here in Chesterfield, but let's open our hearts to God's Word and believe in He'll speak to us today. Maybe today you're in this place and you're searching or uh, there's just a journey that you're going on. I really believe that if you open your heart to God's Word, He'll speak to you. And today you'll, uh, you'll know more of Him. Uh, if you want to follow along with my notes and uh, even make your own notes on the Bible app, then there are QR codes on the screen. and uh, Or you can go on the Bible app, click the three lines and uh, click events, and uh, there you'll find it. And also in Stocksbridge as well, you'll find it uh, for your campus as well. But today, I want to talk uh, from this subject, the fight of your life. The fight of your life. I have an alternative title, and it's WWG. Instead of WWF, as I used to watch it, or WWE as it is now, Wrestling with God. That's my alternative title. It comes from this story in Genesis 32. I'm going to read 10 verses to us, 22 to 32, and it says this. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Jesus, we pray that you would speak to us right now. Lord, that we would know that you are with us and that you are for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I need to do a little bit of uh, kind of background history to this guy, Jacob, that we're talking about. And uh, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, kind of his story because it all leads to this moment. It all leads to this incredible moment where Jacob is in this fight, he's in this wrestle, but it leads to this moment. Jacob was born a twin with uh, his brother Esau, but Esau came out of the womb first. And so we have to understand that because back in uh, the context of the Bible those days, all of the inheritance, the family inheritance, the family name, the authority, the social status, even the spiritual blessing, it would be a transferring of all God had given to the family as the father died. Uh, it, It would be that moment where all of that would be transferred onto the oldest son. And so you have this incredible moment, actually, as, as they're getting to this moment where Jacob and Esau's father is, um, it tells us that he's blind and he's coming to this moment, but Jacob wants this blessing. Jacob wants this inheritance for himself. Jacob wants this blessing. Actually, Jacob's name means deceiver. Uh, it, and uh, translated, it could even mean wrestler. Okay, and so it's a powerful moment, and Jacob wants this. 
and, and the Bible tells us, and it talks about Jacob and his brother Esau, and, and um, it tells us what they're both like. It tells us that Esau is a hairy man. Now, I don't know how hairy you have to be for the Bible to call you a hairy man. I don't know how hairy you have to be, but Esau was a hairy man and, and Esau was the outdoorsy type, like me. They believed it in Stocksbridge. Um, but Esau uh, would go hunting, would, would, would be the hunter. Jacob was the cook. He was the one who was at home most of the time with his mother and he would be the one who would cook and he would do that. But it tells us that Jacob wasn't hairy, but Esau was hairy, and that's important to recognize for us. But Esau comes in from a hunt, and he's hungry, and he's tired, and there's this moment, Jacob's making soup, and, and, uh, and so Esau asks Jacob for some of that soup, and, and Jacob sees his moment, and he says, well, swap me your birthright, and I'll give you some soup. What a terrible deal. What a terrible trade. But how many of us know in the middle of the night when we are thirsty and we head to our fridge and we open the door and the light hits us like the light of heaven, we just grab whatever we can because we are thirsty in that moment. Whatever it is we can't see because of the light, we grab whatever. And many times when we're on the journey, we get tired and we lower our standards. Esau in this moment takes the soup. He lowers his standards. And so now the problem is, is not just uh, we've tricked Esau, I've got to trick my dad as well. His dad's name is Isaac, and many of us will know that because you have the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so they've got to trick his dad, Isaac. And like I said earlier, Isaac's, Isaac's eyes are weak. He's nearly blind. And so he comes up with this plan with his mum. Uh, they get animal hair and they stick it all over his body. And, and um, uh, they, he goes outside and he asks for the blessing from Isaac. And there's this little to and fro where you really, uh, you know, you, you, like Isaac's like touching um, Jacob's arm and he's like, you feel like Esau, but you don't sound like Esau. And I can imagine that moment, Jacob just went, I am Esau. <laughs> and uh, like his voice went really deep. And so then they trick him and he receives the blessing. Esau finds this out. And even though he'd known I'd sold my birthright for a bowl of soup, he vows to kill Jacob. And so Jacob's mum says, you've got to get out of here. Your uncle Laban, he lives over there. Go and work for your uncle Laban. Go to him and go and work. And see this moment, Laban has two daughters. Two daughters' names are Leah and Rachel. And Leah is the older daughter, but Rachel is the younger daughter. And the Bible tells us that Rachel is the better looking daughter than Leah. And so Jacob goes after Rachel. He comes to Laban and Jacob says, hey, I want to marry your daughter, Rachel. And uh, uh, Jacob comes to Laban and he asks, can I marry your daughter, Rachel? And uh, Laban says, okay, you need to work for seven years. Single girls don't settle for anyone who won't work for seven years. <laughs> okay. But Jacob's a deceiver. He's deceived Esau, he's deceived his dad, but now he's going to get deceived by Laban. And so in this moment, after the wedding night, he wakes up and it's not Rachel who's next to him, it's Leah. He didn't know the Bible was that crazy, did you? Like, it's crazy. Now, I know what you're asking because I asked the same question. How did he not know it was Rachel? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, but he got deceived. So he goes to Laban again and he says, you've tricked me. I wanted Rachel. Laban says, well, yeah, I can't marry the youngest daughter without marrying the oldest daughter f first. And, and, um, and so you, you can marry Rachel, but you've got to work another seven years. So she's worth it, gents. It's 14 years worth of work that you've got to do. Okay. 
And so he has to work another seven years. He eventually marries Rachel. He stays with Laban. He works for him for 20 years. But all of this time, Jacob is tricking Laban and he's gaining flock and he's looking after his flock. And Laban's being blessed, but also Jacob's being blessed in this moment. And Laban finds out about it and he gets mad. And, and um, it's this moment where we kind of see Jacob beginning to turn and beginning to trust God. Because he comes and he prays to God and he asks God what he should do. And God tells Jacob to go back home. That means to go back where Esau is. Let's go back a minute. Esau's vowed to kill him and God's telling him to go back where Esau's going to kill him. And that's where we kind of pick up this story where we read earlier. And, and that means that Jacob's got to deal with Esau. And so Jacob has been sending Esau a message, I'm going to come uh, home. He's been sending gifts to Esau to try and like woo him and try and like soften the blow, you know. Uh, when you've had an argument in your house, you know, I bring Debbie chocolate home just to try and soften the blow. Okay, I don't know what, what works for you in your household, but he's trying to do that. And the messenger comes back and says, Esau's going to come out to meet you, but he won't be alone. He'll have 400 men with him. Oh, no. And so he's going to come home. He's coming home to Esau, and he's in this moment. And it feels like this is the fight of his life. The fight of his life, that this would be the wrestle that takes place. And we read it, he sends his wives, his children, his possessions ahead of him and he's left alone. And what fight he, uh, Jacob was expecting was very different to the one he encountered. The fight he thought he was going to expect was with Esau, but the one he encounters that night. And I believe that is the fight for your life. The fight for your life, because the fight, just like Jacob, the fight for your life will look different to what you think it will be. The fight is to have that life-changing experience with God, to know Him, to know His presence. You see, the story shows us, if we, I wanted to do all the background stuff about Jacob. Why? Because the story shows us that God's love and grace comes upon people's lives who don't always deserve it. You know, you might be sat there in Stocksbridge today and you might think, I'm not sure I deserve this. Well, this story shows us that God's love and God's grace comes into the lives of all of us who don't deserve it. The Bible even tells us that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all didn't deserve it. And we see that Jacob's story, often he was dishonest, but he has this life-changing experience with God during this wrestling match. I don't know if as kids you had siblings, but if you had siblings, did you used to fight? Did you used to have wrestling matches? Um, like me, I, I got two brothers. Many of you know Sam, uh, who does all of our media, does an incredible job. Sam is six years younger than me, but uh, I have another brother, Josh, who's 18 months younger than me. And um, me and Josh were either best of mates or worst of enemies. We were either playing really nicely together or we were fighting those things could happen in the same minute actually probably in the space of about 30 seconds like within seconds it could just flip Saturday mornings used to be quite fun in our house because uh, we used to watch a few TV programs and one of the TV programs we love to watch and this is why I kind of had the alternative title of WWG Wrestling with God because we used to watch a little bit of WWF the World Wrestling Federation and we used to watch it and we, we would then um, 
mum and dad used to have this big bed and it was like this wooden bed and it had, it was like four poster bed and had a really thick wood, so, so thick that we could stand on the end and it would be like we were jumping off the top rope and we would be like elbow smashing each other, we would be flipping off onto each other, we would be doing all of that uh, onto uh, mom and dad's bed as kids. And, but every single time that we would do that, we were trying to mimic the moves of the Undertaker and Brett the Hitman Hart and all, all of these wrestlers that uh, we used to watch. And there came a moment where we were banned from watching wrestling. Not because we were playing nicely at like wrestling, but because all of a sudden the wrestle turned into an actual fight. And it wasn't just, oh, I'm going to jump off the top rope and, uh, you know, we're just going to land on each other softly. No, it would be we're proper elbow smashing each other and punches would be thrown and all of this would happen. And um, it, we, we would just fight. We, we, we just had a tendency to fight. My Josh, who's 18 months younger than me, would get Sam, who's six years younger than me, to come and wind me up. And he would do it because Josh is a fighter. He loves to fight. I'm not sure if he still does, but back when he was a kid, he loved, he loved to fight. And so he would send Sam into the room to wind me up. And I would, I would try and be so patient, so meek and mild. Uh, Sam, just leave me alone. I'm trying to play PlayStation here. Just leave me alone, Sam. Sam, just leave me alone. Sam, you're annoying me now. Just leave me alone. And I would shove Sam. And Sam, at the top of his lungs, would shout, Can't believe you've just hit me. <laughs> and who stood behind the door? Josh, ready to come in. And he's like, You do not hit him. <laughs> you knew it was going to happen. You knew it was going to happen. We had um, many of a scrap. I mean, you know, we we're, were on the Lincolnshire showground for what is now known as Awaken as kids, and, you know, we're at this Christian event. Josh hit me with a golf club. <laughs> at a Christian event. I mean, it was a plastic one, given that, but he hit me with a golf club. Like, he loved to wrestle. My dad once was so sick of us fighting that he said, right, no longer allowed to fight in this house. If you want to fight, you have to take it outside. I stood there and went, Maybe we can sort this out. Josh, straight out the door. <laughs> so I'm like, what am I going to do? What, do I, what have I got to do? So I was like, all right, I'll follow him outside. And so I follow him outside. I shut the door. The next thing, Josh comes round from the corner with a plank of wood. Whack! Straight at my leg. What he didn't, I'm saying he didn't realize. I'm putting my faith that Josh didn't realize. There was a rusty nail on the end that went straight into my leg. Now, as soon as he hit me, he knew to run. And so he ran, and I'm chasing him. And then the next thing, I'm like, what's that? I'm like, I've got blood everywhere. I've got this rusty nail in my leg. But Jacob has this moment where he's wrestling with God. <laughs> Not with a plank of wood and a rusty nail. But he has this moment of wrestling with God. And it's the fight of his life. And I believe for each and every single one of us, there are moments where we're wrestling with God, where we have the fight for our lives, where it's the wrestle of, am I trusting? It's the wrestle of doubt. It's the wrestle of uncertainty. It's the wrestle with God. For, for many people, it's even the wrestle of, is God at work? How many of us have been in that situation where we're like, what is God doing? Jacob, Jacob's being sent home to Esau and, and to be honest, 400 men are coming. He's probably expecting, this is it. It's over. Why is God doing this? How many of us had that wrestle? That wrestle with God. But I believe it's so important for us to realize a few principles today. For you guys in Stocksbridge to realize a few principles today about this wrestle with God and this fight for your life and actually... That this fight is about that life-changing experience with God when you realize His goodness, His grace, and His love for your life. And so who, whoever you are, wherever you find yourself today, 
I just got three things for us today to recognize from these, this story about the fight for your life. The first thing is this, you have to meet God for yourself. You have to meet God for yourself. Just like Josh walked out of that door, was ready to fight. I had to go and meet him for myself because like we were, we were fighting. Jacob had to meet God for himself. Uh, in verse 24, it tells us that Jacob was left alone and it was in that moment that he was left alone that a man wrestled with him till break, daybreak. Even when I didn't want to walk outside to that fight with Josh, uh, I walked outside. And I believe for some of us, there are moments where we don't want to go into a place, go into something that God has called us to, but we have to go to meet God for ourselves. Uh, I, growing up in church and being around church, mom and dad being the pastors of the church, uh, many times you can live off other people's experience. You can live off other people's faith. You can even come into church today. You can be sat there and sat on your row and you, there's the faith all around you and you kind of feel the joy and it's an amazing moment. But um, we can live off of that experience. But there'll come a moment where we have to meet God for ourselves. Like I'm not discounting community and the church. We preach about it. I believe in the weekly gathering as the church that we gather together as community, that we stir one another up. As uh, the Apostle Paul wrote, that we don't give up meeting together, that we're in this habit of meeting together. We do this, but there are moments where we have to meet God for ourselves. I love this place because uh, for you guys in Stocksbridge, it's a moment where you can be built up in faith. We can be inspired. We can gather under God's word together and we can be inspired. But I want to encourage us today, you have to meet God for yourself because there comes a time where that faith has to be yours. I can't just live off of borrowed faith. I have to get my own faith. I was a 13-year-old and I was sat in uh, my mum and dad's front room and um, no worship music, nothing on. I just sat there and I had a moment with God where I met God for myself. There was nobody else there, but it was a moment where I met God for myself. That moment marked my life. That moment solidified to me that God is real. And that moment was a calling of, are you just going to turn up and live out of your mom and dad's faith, or are you actually going to believe this for yourself and live this out for yourself? It was a moment as a 13-year-old, I believe that we all need an encounter, a meeting of God for ourselves. But many times we're too bothered about what others think. And I want to encourage us to step out of our comfort zone. I even believe even in a gathering that you can meet God for yourself. In this place that you can meet God for yourself and you need it because there will be moments when you need to know you're not alone there will be moments tomorrow morning when you're not sat in a room with the whole church you'll need to know but I'm not alone God's here he's with me his Holy Spirit's here um, you need it because there will be those moments when you're not alone I am um, playing football I ruptured my Achilles a uh, number of years ago now and um, uh, some of you will know that moment the day after I actually preached with a boot on and um, I have no clue what I was saying because I was on drugs to take the pain away some people say it's the best message I've ever spoken but you know, there were, I had to have an operation to fix my Achilles. And whilst not a big operation, there were moments where I was just on my own. But I never knew, I knew I wasn't alone. I wasn't alone. You know, just, as, just before they put me to sleep, I knew I wasn't alone. When I woke up and realized, Nathan, you're doing a lot of talking. Like, you know, you come round from the drugs and all of a sudden you're like... Why am I talking this much? The only time I talk this much is when someone gives me a microphone and puts me on a stage. Why am I talking this much? But I realized I wasn't alone. 
that God was with me, that God is for me. How did I know that? Because I'd encountered him for myself. Today, you've got to meet God for yourself. We can see the evidence, we can hear the stories, but today, have you met God for yourself? Secondly, you have to meet God in your weakness. What, like, why, this is the question I had. Jacob, why are you even in that place that night? Because wouldn't it just be easier to go back to Laban? Wouldn't it just be easier to maybe reconcile things with Laban? Wouldn't it just be easier to just go somewhere else? But here's why he's in that place. He's beginning to obey God. He's beginning to obey God. God has called him to go back home. We see it in Genesis 31 verses 2 and 3. Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude toward him was not what it had been. Then the Lord said to Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives and I will be with you. Even at the risk of his life, even in this moment at the risk of his life, he's willing to go back home. I, I, I don't know, I just get a sense for some people, maybe it's for someone in Stocksbridge or somebody here or even somebody online today. There has been a calling from God, but you've been afraid to go. But the promise is that if we'll go, he'll be with us that he'll be with us in that place. For some of us, that could be a career change. For some of us, that could be something to do with relationship. Whatever it may be, for some of us, God has called us to do something. And it's a moment where it's like, oh, yeah, but this is scary. Yes, it's scary. But in your weakness, know that God is with you. Know that God is with you. Even at the risk of his life, Jacob is willing to obey God. Even at the risk of not knowing the future, he's willing to obey God. And so what, he's on his own. He's on his own in this moment. And so what's God's response? To hit him. He's on his own. God's response is to wrestle with him. You know, God sometimes has to wrestle with us. Like he leaves Jacob with a limp. I know it's difficult to understand because we, we love the moment of God's grace, but how many of us know that there are moments where we even wrestle with the people that we love for the best for them? Any parents in the place? You wrestle. There's a wrestle with your kids. A wrestle. Moments where it seems like we're fighting, but I want the best for them. I'm willing to fight, I'm willing to wrestle, I'm willing to do this because I want the best for you. And even though it's tough and it's painful, there are moments where we have, to, and it's, but it's powerful. We have to admit our weakness and depend on God. That's the wrestle for some of us today. The wrestle is to actually admit our weakness. Admit the problem, admit the thing that's holding me back, admit the addiction, admit the very thing that I see as a weakness, admit it because it's powerful and begin to depend on God. Many times the wrestle reveals our limp. Many times the moment with God, the encounter with God, it's not somebody else saying you need to sort this out. I believe it's a Holy Spirit conviction that comes on our lives and it will reveal our limp. But let me tell you, Jacob's life was not defined by his limp. Jacob could actually walk into everything that God had for him, even with his limp. It can be painful in moments where we reveal the truth and we have, but we have to meet him in our weakness. It's the painful moments that where we can seem to pull away, but don't pull away. Cling on, hold on to God because he has something great for you. You have to meet him in your weakness. Uh, as I was uh, just doing some research around this message, I came across this picture from Rembrandt and uh, it's, the, it's the wrestle picture of Jacob and uh, God in this moment. And um, I, don't, I don't know what part this is, but there becomes a moment where God uh, touches Jacob's hip and he's clinging on. And, and what a picture for us that sometimes it's just that we're clinging on. 
holding on to God, holding on to what he has for us, holding on to everything. And I believe that God will use your limp for his glory. We can't forget John 11, in John 11 where there's the story of Lazarus, Lazarus who has died and uh, Jesus stays in the place. And when he gets there, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. And he comes and he, he comes to Mary and Martha and they're weeping. And we remember that even in that moment, Jesus wept. He cares for us. He loves us. But at the end of that story, after he's raised Lazarus from the dead, he goes to the tomb angry because this is not the way life should be. He goes to the tomb hang, angry, but when, he's, when Lazarus is raised from the dead, he said this was all for God's glory. Even in the weakness, it'll be for God's glory. And so when does, he's involved in our weakness, when does Jacob figure out that it's God? In verse 28, we see that God reveals uh, who he is because he says, you'll no longer be called Jacob, but Israel because you've struggled with God and with humans. But many scholars would say it's verse 25 when Jacob knows that this is God. And why does he know? Because there's this moment where it says the man saw that he could not overpower him. So he touched the socket of Jacob's hip. That touching hip, actually in Hebrew, that word touch just means he tapped it. He just tapped it. And all of a sudden his hip is gone. It wasn't a stick with a nail in the end. It's just a tap. Suddenly Jacob realized he's no match and he begins to cling on. The next verse tells us, verse 26, tells us that Jacob is holding on. You know, the man saying, let me go. And he's like, I'm not letting you go unless you bless me. I am not letting go. Jacob realized at the moment of his pain, at the moment of his weakness of his hip, that God was here, that God is with him, that God is for him. And in that moment, it became from a wrestle with God to I'm clinging on to God. I'm clinging on to him. I'm holding on because I want the blessing. I want everything that you've got for me. I'm holding on to you, God. In our weakness, we can know God's strength. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul writes, when I am weak, then I am strong. Jacob is effectively done in this fight. In this moment, he is done. His hip is gone. He is done. He is done in this fight. He's been dishonest. He's been a deceiver all of his life. And yet in verse 28, God says this about Jacob. He says in verse 28, and team, I need it on the screen quickly. There we go. Your name will no longer be Jacob, deceiver, but Israel, because you struggle with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob's done in the fight. His hip's gone. Like, I had my Achilles injury. 13 months it took me to get back to a place of playing football. And then it still took me months afterwards to get my fitness back and to get my strength back. And even today, there are moments where I'm like, if it's cold, I know it's cold because my Achilles, I can feel it. Jacob's effectively done, yet God calls him an overcomer. He's an overcomer. He's fighting God. He's fighting with people. And yet God still rewards him. Here's a man powerless and God declares him a winner. How can God say that? Because God in his grace and his love comes to each and every one of us. Whoever we are, wherever we find ourselves, whatever life has looked like, he declares you a winner. He declares today that you can overcome. Finally, with my time nearly gone, hope you're good there in Stocksbridge. Big shout out to Ben and Hannah who lead our youth and took all of our young people to get away. Come on, let's give it up for Ben and Hannah. So amazing. So you have to meet God for yourself. You have to meet God in your weakness. You have to meet God in his weakness. Verse 28, 25, sorry, really troubled me. Because this is God he's fighting with. And it says this, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, that really troubled me because I'm like, this is God. Surely God can overpower him. Surely God, like, do not forget the tap. It was a tap on his hip and his hip is gone. Surely God can overpower him. And then I got it. 
because I love a wrestling match with my two youngest sons, Jude and Silas. I love it, and they love it. Usually it's a more, more of like, let's make them laugh as much as possible. I even do exercise with them, like I do chest press with them. I get them just chest press and all of that. But here's the thing. I never use my full weight. Because if I use my full weight, they're in trouble. And I tell them that. Especially Zion, who is 10. When he thinks he can take me. I've got more in the tank, son. Don't worry about it. Okay, I've got more in the tank. Funny aside, Stocksbridge, you'll love this because you love my dead joke section. But um, whenever anyone talks to me about church from football, sometimes they'll they'll, they'll talk about like, moments and even scripture in the bible and they'll say oh you're not allowed to like you're not allowed to get involved in like fighting and stuff like that and I say no the bible tells me I have to turn the cheek only once so you get two free shots then I'm in the game so make your two free shots count okay and I obviously joking with them but I realized this that when I'm wrestling with my boys not using full weight I remember wrestling with dad once and um get to that age, I was probably around Zion's age, 10 years old, and uh, wrestling, and I saw my moment, it all opened up for me, he let his guard down, there was this moment, Josh has got him occupied, and I'm like, here's my moment, and I sucker punched him in the nose, I got sent to my room, straight away, and he never fought me again, because he knew his full weight wasn't going to cut it. God made himself weak. God made himself weak. God lost ultimately to win Jacob's heart. He lost ultimately to win Jacob's heart. And it points us to the ultimate place where it looked like God lost, but he won through losing. He triumphed through defeat. And that was on the cross where Jesus wrestled with the full weight of justice and sin, but he held on so that you could get the blessing, so that we could get the blessing of God. In his weakness is a realization that he became weak for us. That Jesus took it all so that we get the blows of grace and love that wake us up to his presence. And there's nothing more loving than a weak God. He emptied himself of his power, of his greatness. He lived life as a servant and he willingly died on the cross for you. And what will change you is not just knowing that God loves you, What will change you is knowing that he was willing to become weak for you. So that in my weakness, it could be turned to strength. And I move from just knowing God to encountering him. I move from just knowing God to encounter him. Verse 30 of Genesis 32. So Jacob calls that place Peniel saying it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. He knew how powerful God was, but yet his life was spared. Jacob realized. Tim Keller said it like this, only a holy God is loving enough to become weak. Jacob got it right. In the fight of his life when he was weak, he held on. Hold on to God. Don't let go. Keep seeking. Keep holding. Meet him for yourself. Meet him in your weakness. Meet him in his weakness today. This is the fight for your life. And this fight to surrender is victory. And so today, will you meet him for yourself today? Will you meet him in your weakness today? Will you meet him in his weakness today? And whatever the fight looks like in your life, hold on. Hold on to God. Hold on to his presence. Hold on to him today. And so we're going to do that right now.
would we stand there in Stocksbridge here in Chesterfield? We're going to worship all together. But I believe this moment is a moment to hold on to him for yourself. Maybe today you've been living off other people's faith. Other people around you, maybe it's been a moment where since you've encountered God for yourself personally, this is a moment. I want you to throw off any uh, weight of expectation. I want you to even throw off there are people around me and I want you to, if that's you today, meet him for yourself. Meet him in this moment. Meet His grace and His love today. Hold on to Him in this moment. Maybe today it's a moment where you're holding on to Him in your weakness. A moment of just coming to God and saying, God, this is what I'm struggling with. This is the battle I'm facing, but I'm trusting in You today. I'm trusting in what You have for me. Today I'm coming to You in my weakness. I've had these thoughts. I'm dealing with this, but today I'm giving it to You, God. Would You break in? Would you move in? Today I'm holding on to you and I'm clinging on to you. Bring your grace and your love in this moment. And would all of us meet him in his weakness, that he died on the cross for each and every one of us, that a holy God is so loving that he became weak for each and every one of us. Would we realize his goodness, his grace and his love today? And so whatever that is for you, would you take this moment band are going to start to sing in a moment but would we all close our eyes and just respond to God recognise His presence is here with us His His presence is right there in Stocksbridge and He's moving He's for you thank you Jesus we thank you for your love we thank you for your grace we thank you Jesus we hold on to you we cling on to you find freedom in this place today. Thank you, Jesus.